everyone, welcome back to Rolling Solo. My name is Adam Smith and I'm excited today to be diving back into Madeira Unintentional Malum Act 1. As promised, we put this particular playthrough on hold back a few months ago after completing the very first day and now we're into the second day. We've already done the narrative and story setup and now we're looking to dive straight into the second scenario. So for those wanting to see more content on Madeira, hopefully this will help you making your decision because Madeira is currently back on Kickstarter as of right now for a reprint plus additional content. So hopefully this playthrough will aid you in deciding whether or not this game fits for you. So we are not going to waste any time diving right into the playthrough, but the first thing I want to make mention of before we do is the fact that if you have not seen the prior videos for Madara on the channel, I'm going to put a link in the top right hand corner of this video that you can click on right now. You'll be able to go and check out the showcase, at, which includes the setup day number one, as well as the narrative that leads into this scenario, which will help ground you in what's actually going on in this world. As you can see here, the initiative track has already been set up. We shuffled it, randomized it, laid them out, and we have the Gevidan going first. This is the new creature we're going to be dealing with in this particular scenario. Cave Sickles we're familiar with from the previous day number one. We have three of those on the board. And then of course Rook and Remy are heroes. So here is a quick look at Rook's layout. We have him with four consumables. The norm for limit is three, but he has the Grand Physique skill, which says that he can actually contain and hold another consumable beyond what most other characters can in this world. He also is holding two Warhammers, of which when he does so, is going to give him heavy, which means he's gonna be reduced by one on his movement, so he's moving at a speed of five. That'll be also something we need to keep in mind. We also have his body armor here. Again, these particular cards that are equipped on him are going to have stats that are going to potentially change either health, defense, or movement. Again, we learned a lot about that in the prior videos. I won't go over it here, but want to make mention of it. We also gave Rook the defensive core, which is going to bump up his defense as well as overall health. Again, remember our Zeke linkage here is giving us 10, sorry, 12 extra health, and then once per turn we can reroll a dodge roll. So with 12 health plus the two from this defensive core, that is a total of 14. He already has a health of 14, so he's walking into this one with 28 health. Rook also has a really cool ability called Mend, and Mend allows him to gain two heal tokens at the beginning of an encounter, and it's per encounter, so he doesn't get those back until the next time. But it says when these tokens are spent to heal an ally other than yourself, you get to gain a stamina point as well. So yes, you can heal yourself or an ally, but if you heal an ally, you get an extra stamina point, which is pretty cool. All right, so now time to take a look at Remy's loadout. So Remy has the occult shirt, the ability core, and the war axe going in. We've got a stamina all set up. She has natural flight. We remember this from the previous videos that she can fly, which means she's going to be able to move between elevations easier and obstacles and things like that are going to be less of a problem for her. And then we've got the smoke bomb, the juice box, and throwing knives for her three consumables. The smoke bomb we haven't used yet, and this is a really cool one because it allows us to discard it to not provoke break attacks until the end of the turn, which means when we're up against or adjacent to an enemy, when we move away from that enemy, uh, when we're adjacent, to them, using a smoke bomb can stop that break attack, which is huge if we get into a situation where we're kind of getting bogged down and need to get her out of there. Now, on the other side of things, we got the linked adventure here, giving us 12 HP, an extra stamina point, which is already added into the mix to start. And on the bottom here, if I happen to roll a star, which is just off screen, it says any ally within SOI, and SOI is within a range of four, and that can be traced through diagonal or orthogonal movement, gains one stamina point, which basically just means you get more stamina points you have, the more you can spend during your turn. So stamina is really good that way. So when Gev activates, we see at the very top, Gev is ferocious. So at the start of the turn, it gains courage, which is this token right here. And this is one thing I really love about these tokens. Look at the shimmer on them. There's actual UV coating on the back of the actual token itself, which is really, really cool. And if you flip it over, it even explains exactly what courage is all about. It's passive. It says if you get a star, a shield, or a book, add plus one physical damage. And you discard this if you miss an attack. So we're going to go ahead and just place this right on the card here. We'll move on down for passive. So this adrenaline only triggers when the uh, when Gev is attacked. So that's not going to happen right now. And agile, the first time uh, the first time each turn that Gev is attacked, dodge. So that again won't apply right now. So we move right into the A. AI where we start at the top and move our way through. So now we're going to move through the three different steps here for the AI. 
apply and we're going to go until one of the conditions is true and then we stop and do that. So the first one says, is there an opponent adjacent? No, there is not. So that is false. We move to the next diamond. Is there an opponent within reach two? Well, what is reach two? Well, basically by looking at the board, you can easily tell that nothing's within reach two. And what reach two means is it's a melee attack, but it's allowed to be done at a range of two away. And this thing, Gev, is way too far away from us to be able to attack us from reach two. So we're going to move on down to the next one. Can it move and attack an opponent within reach two? Well, that's a good question. And we'll have to take a look at its movement and do a little bit of looking on the game board to see whether or not it's within range. So on this final AI instruction, it says, can it move and attack an opponent within reach two? Well, movement is six. And when you move into water, it's only going to cost one to move into it. Once you start moving out of it, it costs you two. So this is going to cost two movement points to get out. So that's going to be a total of three burnt so far. Two to get out of this space is a total of five burnt with one left over moving to here. And from here, can we reach one of these two heroes, no, we can't. So none of this can actually happen. And if none of the actual um, conditions are true on the AI card, then nothing happens. One of these three statements on this AI card have to be true. And then you follow the instructions underneath. So right now we are far enough away from this creature to not engage it. But once we get close enough, it's going to come after us. So that is going to finish the initiation or the uh, activation for Gev. And now we can move to the cave sickles. The cave sickles are now next in the initiative order. And we're going to go ahead and take a look at the top section, which we know from previous videos is nothing that we have to worry about at this particular point. So we'll move right into the conditions. Is one of these three true? Starting with the top, is there an opponent adjacent? No, there's not. Second one, is there an opponent within range four? Well, the closest one to us is this one. So one, two, three, four. Nope, not even close. And can it move and attack an opponent within range four? Okay, well, let's try to see if that would work. So first off, one thing I want to mention here is we do have this thing called elevation. So let's get close to that so I can talk a little bit more about how that works. So now let's quickly talk about elevation and cover this so that there's no misunderstandings. The purple line denotes the fact that this is an elevated area here. So you just have to look at the tags to determine, well, which areas are elevated over another one. You can see that elevation one is on this side, which means the ground floor here is at elevation one, which is essentially like ground floor. And then we have elevation three on the opposite side. So so these guys are basically up on a platform that's a difference of two and why the difference between three and one matters is because the game handles those differences in elevation differently if that makes sense so if there is a difference of only one let's say hypothetically this was elevation two and elevation one and so that's only a difference of one, then the casicles could actually come to the edge, jump down and go back up as much as they want. Our heroes could come to the edge, jump up, jump down, no problem at all. Everyone's able to kind of move in and around that. But because this is an elevation three and an elevation one, things change. If my hero happens to get to here, I can't move up to this third level. I actually can't get up there at all. It's too high. The only way that I'd be able to is if I had flight like Remy does, then elevation wouldn't matter and I could fly up there no problem. Now in terms of the cave sickles in a situation just like this where we have elevation three and one, if the cave sickles actually wanted to come down off this, you'd think they'd be dropping from a high height and they are. They don't take any damage or get hurt. They can actually come off uh, a difference of two elevation, no problem, and come down to the lower level and continue onwards. But what they can't do is go back up. So once they've come down that cliff, it's too high for them to go back up again. So keep that in mind as well. Now, the highest elevation in the game is elevation four. And if there is a difference of three, meaning if you're moving, let's say hypothetically, this was elevation four in this area, and this was elevation one, First off, there's no way that this individual, being Rook, could ever get up on top of an elevation four or with a difference of three. Just would never happen. Uh, Remy still could fly up on elevation four, no problem, because she has flight. But these cave sickles couldn't get down. If they were on elevation four, down to an elevation one, and they actually moved over the edge, they'd be instantly defeated and killed, which would never happen in this game anyway, because the AI will never do something that guarantees their death. The only times that They'll put themselves in risky situations is if there's like caverns or a, a basically like a 
a giant pit that they're trying to jump across because that at least has a chance that they might survive. They're not going to purposely jump off a cliff and kill themselves. Uh, so basically that essentially covers elevation and we probably won't be using all that much in this because the cave sickles are likely to kind of come off that platform at some point. The one other thing that's really cool to note is that if you have a character that's sitting here who has ranged and Remy or Rook I should say doesn't have range but let's say hypothetically he did and he actually was going to make a ranged attack from here, he couldn't target any of these cave sickles when they're above elevation uh, from him, if they're not on the same playing field. The reason is, is because they have to actually be on the edges of the elevation for him to see them. So basically these cave sickles have to be here, or one of them has to be here, for him to target one of those. If they're back at least one space, can't do it. And the same thing goes if Remy was over here, and I keep calling Remy, it's Rook, if he was over here and this cave sickle was actually here, even though this is on the edge, there's technically one other space in between, so it would be blocking. There's no way that I'd be able to take a shot at him. I'd have to basically have a clear shot like so. So we're gonna try the very last condition of the AI card to see whether the cave sickle is even gonna activate, and it is can it move and attack an opponent within range four? So first, its movement is six. And remember, we talked about it can come down off this elevation with no harm. It'll never be able to get back up though. One, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if I draw one, two, three, four in range, I still can't get to the heroes. So the, and this being the closest cave sickle to my heroes, none of the enemies are going to activate, which is actually a huge plus for us going as late in the activation as we did. And the biggest win for that is the fact that we get to kind of get a leg up on them or at least get close enough to them without being hit first. So that was kind of a plus because if we had gone first, we would have, probably would have been in range of both of those enemies. All right, so the cave sickles have gone and Rook is up next and Rook has a plan here and this is my plan. So first off, we know both of these guys did not activate on their turn. What that means is at the end of the round, we're gonna gain what's called an urgency token and once we get four of those, we lose. The reason for that, you can't just sit around and hope that the enemy does what you want. Uh, the game allows for a little bit of that but not enough that you can you know, use it to your advantage uh, a lot. So we're gonna gain one because of the fact that both of the enemies didn't have a true condition on their AI card activate. So that's gonna cause us to gain an urgency token in the round, we'll, we'll pull that later. I just definitely want to mention that though, but the cool thing is we get the advantage of actually being able to go through a round without actually being hit, which was kind of a plus, which is part of the reason why you get these urgency tokens as a way of balancing out the game. So you are not allowed to basically sit still forever and just hope that things will happen. Uh, the game will actually fail over time if you do so. So it kind of pushes you and it's called an urgency token for a reason. So we're gonna start off here with Rook because Rook is next in the initiative track. I'm gonna have Rook go five spaces. He is currently heavy because he has two of these hammers equipped. So he's only going five instead of six. So one, two, three, four, five to here. Now I could spend additional stamina because that stamina point right there is what allowed him to do his move. I could spend another stamina from his pool to gain two more movement, but I don't want to be that close. I'm trying to pull these cave sickles off this elevated cliff and down into this lower pit area to hit me from range. I'm actually okay with that because once I can get them off the elevated cliff, I can actually run in there with my hammers and start doing some big time damage. Uh, when they're up here on top, I can't get Rook up there, so it's useless for me to get any closer and actually be helping them by doing that. So I'm gonna hold on to that one extra uh, stamina point because I don't wanna move two steps forward. Uh, so right now we spent the one for a movement. We got to where we wanna be, and honestly, that's all I'm gonna do during this turn for Rook. Remy is up next. We're gonna go ahead and spend one stamina point to have Remy move six spots. And based on my movement, that's not bad at all. So one, two, three, four, five, and then right into the water area for six. Remember when you move into water, it only costs one. It's moving out that costs you more. Good news is later on, I could potentially just spend two stamina in order to naturally fly out of it if I really want to not lose the movement, but we'll see whether that's worth it at that time. That's all I want to do for Remy's turn. So that is going to conclude the end of the round. So we will be taking one of these urgency tokens and we'll place that right here. If I get four of these, I'm going to lose the game. 
So here goes round number two. Gev is beginning us off, and Gev can't do anything. The AI, three different uh, possibilities. We go through them one at a time, none of which will actually be able to reach a range of my heroes. So that turn is done quickly. Now, Courage still stays on him as every time this character activates, it's always going to gain Courage. So that, basically, that is going to stay on him pretty much the entire game. So I'm leaving that there. And we move right on to the Cave Sickles, which are going to be the ones we planned on having come off of this elevated platform towards us. So the first thing is, is there an opponent adjacent? No, there is not. Is there an opponent within range four? No, there is not. Can it move and attack an opponent within range four? So we'll start with the very first cave sickle, the red one here. It's going to move up to six, and it says here, can it move and attack an opponent within range four? Yes, it definitely can. So it's going to move to be up to a range four from the nearest opponent. All right, so we're going to do exactly that. So we're going to go one, two, three down off the cliff, four, and I believe one, two, three, four. That will put it within range. So it's perfectly happy right there. Second cave sickle, based on the numerical value and the coloring across the top up here, is the purple one. So one. One, two, three, four down off the cliff, five and six within four range of Remy again. Remy's getting a lot of heat here. And then lastly, we have the orange one, but there is a space here we can't move through. So let's go around it. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And I believe this will also be within range of six, or four, I should say. So that is perfect. Not so good for Remy. She's got lots of attacks coming her way. Now, one thing I want to be really clear of, guys, is that I moved Remy up to six spaces. She actually had seven, but I only chose to move six. I might have actually said that wrong earlier on. I might have said that she only had the six, which is her base movement. I should have said she had her base movement of seven because the occult shirt also gives her the plus one, which you can see right here. So I did have seven, but I didn't want to get any closer anyway, because again, my goal was to get these guys off the cliff. I just want to clarify that in case there's any confusion about people wondering, why didn't I go the full seven? So here comes the attack. So first off, we have two white dice is what the cave sickles typically use on attacks, but they also have hive minds. So when they have friends like these two right here in amongst them, they can upgrade their die. In this case, each one of them gives an upgrade to the die to flip these ones from two whites to two oranges, which is not fun. I am being attacked currently, and I'm going to use the occult shirt to exhaust this particular card at the bottom to dodge. And what that's going to allow me to do is roll a black die in the mix of these three dice or two other dice I should say and try to attempt to dodge this attack. So here's hoping that this pans out for me. I'm going to go ahead and roll these off. Again, any shields that we see on the black dice are going to add to the defense total. My defense total right now on Remy is 10. So here we go. All right, so we got a serious roll there. That actually could help out quite a bit. And I can tell you right now that dodge was completely effective from that ranged attack because the total here is 12 across the two dice. And with three shields on my dodge dice added to the 10 defense that I already have, that's 13. This 12 didn't get equal to my defense or higher, so it is considered a miss. And now we're going to go ahead and see whether we can counter. Now, normally this would be a great time to try to counter, and I could have because I do have the ability core on Remy and I could exhaust that to do it, but Remy's not in range, but not being beside these cave sickles because the only attacking weapon that she has to make an attack with is the war axe. She does have throwing knives, but that's a consumable, and counters are all about using the actual weapon that you have equipped. Consumables are a whole different story, so no countering yet, but something we can look forward to. Still, the dodge was totally worth it as it worked to avoid this cave sickle's attack. So next up we have the purple cave sickle making its attack with the exact same parameters as before. All right, so the next attack for the purple cave sickles coming up and oh, lucky, lucky. So a miss again for the purple one just barely misses me. Uh, a 10 defense is what I had, so I am safe there. And now we're gonna roll for the orange one, come on. Oh, even better. We got an eight. So I got super lucky. That's awesome. So no hits at all for any of the activations of the cave sickle. And now Rook is a little bit furious at what's going on. I feel like he's going to get right in there. 
So Rook likes being the center of attention. He's going to spend one stamina and he's going to move five spaces. One, two, three, four. He's going to get right into the heart of these guys. So he starts swinging his battle axes at them. So Rook is going in there swinging. He's going to go ahead and spend two stamina now. So he's told, spent a total of three and this is going to allow him to attack. He's going to use two white dice for each of the hammers that he has. He's going to exhaust one of his hammers for the empower ability, which will give him a black die. So we're going to exhaust that over and we've got Got a black die now into the fold and now we're going to do ourselves a little roll and see how well we do we're going to try to hit the center sickle right in the middle of the purple one all right so wish me luck here i'm hoping for good things oh that's pretty solid that is a good roll that's going to be extremely useful let's tally up how much damage we've done so with that roll here of 11 and the defense of the cave sickle at eight, it's going to be a difference of four hits coming to the cave sickle. And then on top of it, with its health being six, two shields can be spent in order to gain one physical damage for each two shields spent, as you can see on the card right here. So we're going to do that. And that is enough right there to actually have a perfect roll to wipe out one of the cave sickles so we went right down the middle and just blew that guy right out of the water so that was perfect and rook's turn is down to his last stamina so he has to make a decision here as to whether or not he does anything else after some thought i think i'm going to hold on to my last stamina for rook and we're going to pass it over here to remy to go next Remy's going to spend one stamina point to move right up against this particular cave sickle, the orange one, and she is also going to attack as well. And based on the cards that she currently has, I don't believe I have anything that I can use to empower, but I could technically spend some stamina to do so. And I believe I'm going to, I'm going to spend that last stamina point to empower her attack. So she's going to be using her uh, war axe. So she'll get a black die for the empower and then two white dice for the war axe. And then we're going to go ahead and take a look at that card quickly. It says here on the war axe, if we exhaust when determining damage, this weapon gain for every book a plus uh, plus one physical damage until the attack is resolved so that's actually pretty awesome so I'm gonna go ahead and exhaust her war axe to gain that ability on the very bottom there of course she gets the stuff in the black automatically but by exhausting she gets this book benefit as well and now we're gonna go ahead and roll some dice see how this pans out we're looking for anything that totals up to above the defense of eight hopefully this works out that was not a good roll at all. The good news is that she has a hammer helm card which says to exhaust on the bottom when making an attack if you have a two-handed weapon equipped you may re-roll any dice in your combat dice pool. That sounds pretty awesome and those books landed great for extra physical damage so I want to keep this one but I need to re-roll those two whites to hope to get up to eight. So let's go ahead and do that and see how it pans out. Here's hoping I get a much better roll than what I just saw. That is way, way better. Things have changed drastically. Ooh, I even got a star there as well. Lots to look at. Now that was an incredible roll. So first off, I got 11, which is way past the defense I needed of eight. And because of that, the difference is going to be a three hits just from that alone. And then we go to the shields. For this war axe, every shield gives me a plus one physical damage as it says on the card. So that's really gonna add up from three, four, five, six, seven, and then the books, eight, nine, 10, 11, thanks to the fact that I exhausted it. That is ridiculous amount of damage and probably would have almost outright killed this guy over here because it's 12 if I had got that kind of great attack on it. That's phenomenal, although its defense is probably higher. Yes, it's 11, so that probably won't work so well on that other one, but that is a fantastic attack. And I got the star. And the star actually triggers from my linked adventurer because we're playing the linked two player variant. It says an ally within SOI gains one stamina point. So this is gonna come in really handy because, well actually it may not actually because most of this stuff is gonna reset anywhere we're at the back, but we basically gain a stamina point on Rook because he's within four of uh, Remy currently. And that's gonna do it. This cave sickle has been blown off the map. We have a lot less to worry about over there and uh, we're looking pretty good right now. All right, so Gev is going to start off this next round. And as you can see, Gev is not going to do anything because he cannot get to us. If I tried to move his full movement, just to show you guys, it's six. So it would be one into this area, two into here, two into here, 
and he'd have one left over after that, but he wouldn't have enough to get out of this water as it would cost him two. And his reach is only two so that max he could hit something here. So it's not going to work for any of the different conditions on his AI card. Nothing can be considered true. So because of that, he's going to stay where he is. It'll be a fight that we're going to be having very, very soon. So now we move over to the cave sickles. There's only one left because I've destroyed so many of them so far. And this cave sickle is going to be attacking Rook. All right, so the cave sickle is going to activate right now. And you can see right here, the very first one is going to read it off to you. It says, is there an opponent adjacent? Yes, there is. It is Rook. And so it's going to attack Rook and it's going to be making an attack. Now, the nasty thing about this particular condition here that's going to trigger is that it talks all about the fact that it's going to follow up multiple times. It says, make an attack against the opponent with the most damage, then follow up and make another attack against the same target, and then follow up again and make an attack against the same target. So it's just going to hammer me into to the ground which is kind of unfortunate so three attacks coming my way but if anyone's going to take the attacks i think i put rook in a good position here he can hopefully dodge his way out of this for a couple of them we'll see how it goes also this cave sickle is not going to benefit from any of the hive mind because i've wiped out all of his friends so now he's just rolling the two white dice i'm going to go ahead right now and use defensive core to exhaust to get a dodge roll in there as well because hey that doesn't uh, i don't see how that could be a bad thing and we're going to roll to see whether or not this cave sickle actually can even land a hit all right here is the roll we're hoping for misses that is a seven that is not going to hit, not even close as this defense here is gonna boost me up to levels that he can't even reach if he tried. Uh, currently right now, my total defense is 10, I believe, yes, 10, plus the two is 12, just, just no chance I was gonna land. And as we all know, what's absolutely fantastic about that roll is no follow-ups happen if the actual cave sickle missed on the first one, which is great. So the greatest thing about this is if I can potentially counter, I can do so. I'm taking a look at Rook's cards right now, and he doesn't have anything that can force a counter. So that is not going to work in my favor. I do have the counter ability with Remy, but not with Rook. So I just have to deal with the fact that he missed, but hey, it's not bad. We should be able to handle him going into Rook's turn right now. So Rook is going to activate and who else is he gonna attack? This cave sickle sitting right beside him. He's gonna go ahead, he's going to take one of his Warhammers and he's gonna expend it by exhausting it to empower it, giving him the two white dice he always has, but this black one for the empower. And we're gonna roll and hope we get a decent hit on this thing to take it out. So here we go. That is an eight, so that was not exactly the strongest roll ever, but it works because the Cave Sickle's defense is an eight, so it's considered a success, but now we have to try to muster up some hits. Now, we're probably not gonna get that many on this one, but essentially, this one says that we would, for every two shields, gain one hit. So we know one damage is possible. Books-wise, that's not gonna help us at all. There's nothing here on these cards that I could use for books that are going to work for me. So this cave sickle is gonna take one damage in the end, which really isn't that great. Not a very strong attack. Now, just so you guys are aware, that costs two stamina points to do. I still have two stamina points to spend. So why don't we go ahead and do another attack and we'll do the exact same thing. I'm gonna exhaust the Warhammer, the other Warhammer that he has to empower it. So I get to roll again, the exact same thing. We need a better hit than that one for sure. So this is certainly a rule that you don't want to see because this rule means that we have completely missed. Whenever you empower your attack, if you ever roll this skull, it doesn't matter what you rolled on the numerical values of the other dice to try to get above or match the defense of the, the uh, defendant you're attacking, you miss anyway. So because I kind of pushed, and that's the risk reward with the empower dice, it's not always going to be in your favor every once in a while, it's going to mess with you, and it did it just there. So it makes this entire attack for Rook at the end of his turn a complete wash. 
All right, Remy, let's spend one stamina point to begin your turn. We're gonna have you move one and two to get right next to the cave sickle. We are rolling two white dice using the war axe and we are going to be exhausting this particular war axe to gain that uh, ability there for the books as we saw from before. We're also gonna spend one additional stamina when we make this attack. So basically we did one stamina for the movement, two for the attack and we're gonna empower it. That's right, we're gonna risk it even though it failed for us last time. We're going to hope that we don't see that skull again this time. So let's roll these dice and see how this pans out. Come on, we only need five damage to take this thing down. There's a better roll. So we got ourselves a 12. Oh yeah, this thing has got to be gone. So 12 and then we have an 8 defense. So we've already got four hits on it. And then if you start adding up 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, like it just gets crazy. She has just smashed the head straight off this cave sickle. It is gone. So we have just eliminated the cave sickle completely. That whole group has been removed from the game now. So that's fantastic. And this is actually going to allow us to pull a combatant loot card, which we'll do right now. And we gained... Eight gold, look at that. So Remy is walking away with eight gold thanks to taking out the cave sickles. And uh, now we're gonna move on to the end of round, reset our stamina and head back in with Gev, who is the only enemy left in this particular cave. All right, so we're going into a brand new round. Gev is going to start us off and Gev is too far away from us. So we know at the end of this particular round because the AI is not going to activate, it's going to give us another urgency token. So we'll move right along here to Rook who's going to go next. Rook is right here. We got to figure out what our strategy is on how we're going to take Gev down. All right, so we got to get Rook in there. So we're going to go ahead and spend one stamina here to have Rook move five. So one, two, three, four, five. That's as far as I can go with him. I could spend more stamina points to get closer, but I think I'm going to stop right there. Um, I should still be able to get into range of this individual later on once it comes out to attack me a little bit so i'm going to stop right there i'm going to keep all the stamina that i currently have and now we're going to go ahead and move over to remy now going ahead with remy the one thing i want to take note of is the fact that the amount of total damage that rook can take is much higher so i'm going to go ahead and have remy go around behind him i don't want to have uh, this particular enemy gev go after uh, remy first i'd rather rook be hit first so remy's going to go one, two, three, four, five, and just put herself right up behind uh, like that so that we ensure that Rook is going to be the target of whatever attack comes in the next round. That is going to be the end. Of course, that only costs one stamina point to do, and we are done. So now we're going to rotate around. We're going to reset everything, and we're going to start off with Gev again. So we are beginning a new round. We don't want to forget about the urgency token that I deserve for not having the AI activate in the last round. So now, just so you guys are aware, I have two urgency tokens. If I get four, the mission is a failure. So I really don't want to be pushing that any further. Uh, in other words, I don't want to have the AI just sitting there, but that's probably not going to happen much now that I'm kind of up close and personal with Gev. So we're gonna start with Gev activating here on the AI card. We already know he has courage. We'll be using that when he rolls. Sadly, it's gonna give him benefits and physical damage, which is nasty. So first off here, is the opponent adjacent? No. Is there an opponent within reach two? No. Can it move and attack an opponent within reach two? Yes, because it has movement of six and reach two gives it two more on top of that. So it could definitely make it. So if that statement is true, we move to be up to two reach from the nearest uh, opponent. Nearest opponent would be Rook right now. So from here, one into the water, two right here. And that's three movements spent so far. And as of right now, within range or within reach range of two. So it's going to stop its movement and make its attack. And right now it's going to make an attack within reach one, which or which within reach two, which it's doing. And it's going to be using these two dice right here, which you've never seen before in this playthrough, which is kind of cool and scary at the same time, but they're more powerful than normal. This is going after Rook, so Rook is going to happily use his defensive core by exhausting it in order to ensure that he doesn't get too, too beat up by this. And he's going to put this in the mix, a black die, hoping to add to his defensive total, which is 10. He does have one armor, though, but one thing to keep in mind is that uh, Gev has two armor piercing, which means he's going to ignore the first two points of armor that Rook has anyway. So it's kind of a moot point. Uh, but I do have uh, my body armor on Rook that says, when you are dealt damage, reduce physical damage dealt to you by two. And I can exhaust that card in order to gain that benefit. It's on the bottom here. So that could be something that is worthwhile doing, depending on how this roll goes. 
So here we go. Hope for the best. Okay, a 10. So, oh no. So that is, uh, that's a complete miss. Now, when you get a skull on a dodge roll, because it's important, it just means that these abilities provide no, um, uh, you know, no additional benefits provided. Now, normally I'd say, oh no, because if you're rolling this as an empowered die, that would be terrible. Uh, that would wipe out your entire attack. But when you're rolling it for a dodge, it just means you completely failed. Uh, the attack still continues on. So as of right now, a six and a four lands on me, which as of right now, I have um, 10 defense. It hit a 10, so it does hit. But in terms of getting, doing damage, it has a book and a shield. And we know from the courage token here, it says that stars, shields, and books add one physical damage. So it's coming at me for two physical damage. Now I have one armor, but it's useless because of the armor piercing. But I did just mention that I have this body armor so I can go ahead and exhaust this when I'm dealt damage to reduce it by two. And bam, I didn't take anything on that attack. So that worked out pretty good. So now we've done with that first step of the AI and we're gonna to move to the next one. It says, then move to be up to reach two from the furthest opponent within movement range. So basically go after somebody else. In this case, it's gonna be Remy. So it's gonna move two like this because two to get out of the water space and into here. It's within two reach now of Remy. It's going after another or different opponent. And Remy is gonna be the target of this attack. So Remy's going to do something semi-similar to what uh, uh, Rook did and instead will use the shirt that she has and exhaust it to dodge, which is going to give her the black die in the mix as well. And we hope that this lands well enough to not hurt her too badly. Hey, that's better. So eight on the roll should be a complete and utter miss. So that's a good thing. Um, now I would normally be excited in this situation because I'd be able to try to counter, uh, but because I'm two spaces away and I have a melee weapon with Remy, I can't counter. So nothing really happens, but I also got a ton of defense. So there's no way with the defense that I have on my character, which is 10 for Remy plus the three I got right here, there's no way that this was gonna pass. So the, the attack completely misses, which is great. Now we're moving to the bottom of this card that says, then just make a regular attack at reach two, which essentially means these two are exactly equal distance. So you basically go to your initiative track, whoever's first in order takes precedence. So Rook is gonna be the target of this attack. Can Rook do anything about this? Well. Not really. Uh, as of right now, the only thing I could do is spend one stamina to gain a dodge die. Last time I got to you know, exhaust my defensive core, but I don't have that anymore. So I'll go ahead and spend a stamina going into this round, um, which is gonna short me when I actually activate, but it's gonna help me right now on defense to hopefully avoid some, some pain. So there we go, we got our, actually that's perfect. Uh, I didn't even actually need it because I only rolled a nine and I already have a 10 for defense. So that is a complete miss. So nothing happening there. So Gev has now completely activated all the way through. And now we can really get into an interesting situation where we can try to use flanking to our advantage. So I'm gonna activate Rook next and we're gonna decide where we wanna put Rook. My guess is that I'm gonna keep Rook on this side and probably have Remy flank from behind so we can gain some bonuses. So we'll activate Rook. We'll use one stamina point in order to move Rook. And we're going to go one space here and then two into the water. Remember now that I'm in the water, I'm not going to be able to dodge. So dodging is going to become a problem now going forward because I'm just not going to be able to take advantage of that when I'm inside the water. But I do, I'm here right now and I do still have two stamina left. So I'm definitely going to take a swing at trying to put some damage on this thing. Now attacking Gev is a whole other ball of wax because Gev has some abilities on his card that says each time that uh, Gev is attacked, um, he will counter with an attack at up to reach two. So he is going to hit back. Um, and then he's also agile. So it says the first time each turn that Gev is attacked, he's going to dodge, which is going to present a problem as well. But we're still going to go ahead with this attack anyway. I am going to go ahead with my Warhammer here and do what I normally do, and that is exhaust this to get the empower bonus, even though it's risky with that black die, I get a skull. 
I get my two white dice like this. All right, so I'm happy with what I'm doing with Rook. So I'm gonna take these dice and move them away for a second because we know that our opponent here is gonna try to dodge first. Now I'm gonna bring this black die back to my pool later on, but for right now I need it to roll for the dodge, which is specifically mentioned right on the card. Now normally uh, combatants or enemies don't dodge unless there's a keyword like this one that states it does. So it's gonna roll right now to see whether it's gonna add anything to his defense, which is currently at 11, has no armor, though so here we go hopefully it's a really low roll that is not what I wanted to see so that just bumped his defense up to 15 which is extremely aggressive and I'd have to roll really really well to do any damage for that so I'm gonna go ahead with the attack anyway because I'm in the middle of it anyway I can't take uh, can't go back at this point and we're gonna roll away we got ourselves a nine, that is not gonna be close enough. And we also got a bunch of shields and we got a book as well. So this is exactly how you have to set up a flank. Now your flanking has to be in a way that you can draw a line from one of your heroes straight through the combatant or the target of your attack to the other hero on the opposite side. In other words, I couldn't have Remy over here like this on an angle, it has to be straight through. This is considered full on flanking. And when that happens, you're gonna gain plus one to your attack rolls, meaning the chance of landing an actual hit is going to be higher and then on top of that you get three extra physical damage which is huge and then on top of that if you have abilities or other things like backstab as an actual tag on your card you can gain plus two to your attack rolls or and five physical damage so it can really add up quite a lot because of course if you're using backstab you're going to get a little bit more of an actual hit there and a better chance at hitting in general so still pretty good odds though we're going to roll with two of these white dice now i don't have any more stamina to empower this roll so it's going to roll just as it is but we have to talk about what gav is going Going to do in relation to this attack. So just before we do Remy's attack here, I don't want to forget about the fact that Adrenaline would have activated at the end of Rook's attack in the last turn that Rook had. So this was in the same game round that we're currently playing, but I forgot that Gav would actually attack back with a counter attack. And it's going to attack uh, Rook in that particular case, as Rook would have been the closest individual to him in the initiative order and everything else, because Remy wouldn't have been over on this side. And been back over here so we're gonna roll for an attack against rook and see how this lands probably not going to be a good thing it's two of these dice as we've seen before i have no way to do anything about blocking this so we'll see how it goes all right so we got a seven and a five that's fairly high so that's a 12 and we currently have uh, 10 defense so that it's going to be two damage that's going to go towards rook right there so i don't forget about those uh those abilities that allow you know allow the enemy to attack back so two damage tokens are going to go onto rook and now we've satisfied that attack back. Now what I'm looking at is I'm looking at going into Remy's attack here where we're gonna be using her abilities. The fact that she's uh, now in a flanking position and gets a plus one on her roll when she rolls her two white dice. You can see here it says agile the first time each turn the gav is attack dodge now when it says each turn my understanding is every character that starts is starting its own turn like every one of these things in the activation or initiation row is a turn so it's going to be able to try and dodge right now which is unfortunate so i'm going to have to try to do back to back hits on him to get around this silly dodge that he always gets so i'm going to roll the dodge roll right now for him see what see how it lands oh he got books that's perfect that's a full-on miss he got nothing so now we're rolling these two we get a plus one on it and the defense is only 11. so this is our chance to actually get through his defenses come on and i'm just going to double check quickly to make sure i have nothing else that i could possibly add to this and I don't believe I do. Nope. So I'm gonna move on with this roll and hope for the best. Oh, that's painful. So that is not going to be enough. So even though we're in a flanking position and we have a 7-2 plus one for flanking is 10, we're under the 11 defense that we needed to actually get any damage to go through. So we just barely miss, which is unfortunate. And guess who is lashing back at us? He's not very happy using adrenaline here. He's going to counter us and he's going to attack Remy and he's rolling two of these nasty dice. Let's see how much damage comes across here. 
Oh, that's a heavy hit. So we got a five and an eight. And if we take a look at all the different, oh wow, that's really gonna add up quick. So eight and five, we've got a total of 13. I've got 10 over here, so he's hitting me for three right away. And then for all the symbols here is another five. So he just hit for eight damage on Remy. That is a lot of damage. That was not so good. All right, so it's still Remy's turn. Remy is going to decide right now to use her juice box as a consumable for fun. We're just gonna go ahead and drink that juice box to get rid of three of the damage she just took. So she's gonna reduce her six down to a total of three. And she is going to now get a little bit aggressive, a little bit angry, and she's going to attack back, but she has no more stamina as we've used it all, but she's going to use throwing knives. She's going to discard these throwing knives to get a purple die and try to chuck these throwing knives and make a killing blow. If I get super lucky here, I'll get exactly what I need. If I don't get lucky, I'm going to need to go back to the drawing board through another round of hoping to make the hits that I need to kill him. So here we go. Wish me luck. I'm hoping I land this on the first roll. Oh, three. Okay, so it's not, not as much as I really wanted there, but it's something. So that's going to push us up to a total of nine. So close, close to death, but that throwing knife has been discarded. It is gone, and that's been resolved. That is the end of the round, so we're going to reset, and we're going to start it off with Gav attacking us again. All right, so we're starting things off with Gav, and Gav's got his courage on him, as he always does. Is there an opponent adjacent? Yes, there is. There's actually two of them. So the first one in the initiative order is Rook, so it's going to continue to go after Rook. So the first thing it's going to do is make an attack. Huh, this is not good. So here we go. We're going to take two of these wonderful dice, which it's going to be rolling against. Uh, poor Rook. Now I can make a decision here as to whether I want to try to defend against this. I'm going to definitely use my defensive core to exhaust so I can get a dodge roll in there. So we'll roll this all together and see how we do. Here's hoping. Okay, so we got two. That's pretty good. All right, it landed a 12. No! That's the worst because I literally have a 12 with this. And I know you guys can't see that on screen, but now you can. So there's 12 right there. I got two shields on top of the 10 defense I have. It's 12 as well. Still considered a hit. So now it just comes down to the symbols and Gav gets a hit for every single symbol based on courage. So four damage coming my way. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to exhaust my body armor again here, going into a new round, I was able to unexhaust that to reduce that by two, so I'm taking two damage on Rook, but that's still not exactly what I wanted to have happen. And the party is not over yet, there's still more going on here. The next thing that's gonna happen is it's going to move to be at up to reach two from the furthest opponent within movement range. So in this case, there's going to be literally no movement whatsoever because he's already within range. He doesn't need to go anywhere. And of course, anything that he does would cause a break attack, which he isn't going to try to do on himself. So he's going to stay exactly where he is. And then we move to the next section, which says, then make an attack with within reach two. And of course, because his friends are around him, he's going to go ahead and attack Rook again because they're equal distance and Rook is highest on the initiative priority ladder. So Rook is going to take this hit. Now, can Rook do anything about this? No, he doesn't have the ability to do any kind of dodging anymore. He's run out of the ability to dodge, which is unfortunate. And this is going to be a roll that likely is just going to put some damage on him. So let's see how this goes. All right, so eight and a four. That's pretty high. So he has a 10. Um, again, he goes through armor, as we know, 12. So it's two damage going against him, which isn't terrible, I guess. It could have been a lot worse, but two damage is going up on Rook. So Rook total right now for damage has a six. Yee, he's getting up there. Okay, so that is the end of his turn. And finally, Gav is done punishing us. And now it's going to come back to the heroes to try to take it down. All right, so Rook is going into this one. He's going to exhaust his Warhammer here to get in power, which is great. But first, we get to roll a dodge die. This is the first. Uh, uh, he's agile, essentially. We know this. So he's going to roll to see how much of a dodge he gets on this attack. We also have to make sure we spend our stamina, of course, to actually do the attack. And we got two. It's two shields on top of the... Uh, 11 defense it currently has is 13. And we're going into this with two white dice and a black die because I'm empowering as well. So I'm gonna add another stamina in there. 
to empower. Or actually, sorry, I don't have to do that because I exhausted my hammer. I'm gonna use that to attack again later, hopefully. So we're gonna roll here. We're gonna hope for good things. We are flanking right now, so we do get the plus one. So that's great. And here we go. Here's hoping that this uh, this lands well. Oh, we gotta get, we gotta get up to 13, which is pretty high. Oh, that is super close. Because, oh, that's super close. Uh, we have a, an extra one because we're flanking. Uh, it would be a 12. It would have been perfect if he hadn't have gotten the dodge roll that he did. Um, but my, So yeah, I didn't hit at all here, so that didn't work out for me. Uh, what I can do is I can try to attack again, but I'm not going to be able to empower. I'm just going to be rolling again. But he doesn't get dodge on this one. So because I'm going after him a second time, now I have a chance because he's only at 11 defense. So I need to roll really well again. Otherwise, this is another swing and a miss. So here's hoping. There we go, a six and a five, this is it. And then we get a plus one for the, because we're flanking, so it's a 12. So already right now we have one damage going through. And then for symbols with this particular attack, I didn't mention this, but I definitely did it. Uh, the hammer here, the second hammer was definitely exhausted during this attack. Um, I'm able to use two shields on those dice to gain one hit. And I also, oh my gosh, is that, oh, that's right. and. Wait a minute. Oh no, I don't think I actually got all the damage that I needed to do to kill it. So let me see here. So I've got 12 on there, 11. So that's, so just on the, on the actual attack roll itself, I get one damage, which is great. So that's gonna put him up to uh, 10. We need 12 to kill him. Uh, I currently have three shields there. I can convert two of them to another physical damage. So that puts one more on him. That was a three. So, oh, now I now I really messed it up. Uh, so it's 5, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's right. So this is how much I have on him right now. And I don't have the ability to convert books at all with, uh, with Rook. So that's unfortunate. I can't actually do enough damage with anything that I have right now to kill him. <laughs> so that's actually really sad at the same time because I was really hoping that that would be the killing blow. He's going to actually survive this, which means he's going to attack me back. Um, so that's unfortunate. So I'm going to have an attack back now. He's countering me with his adrenaline. He's going to roll. He's putting a beat down on me. Oh, this is good news. That was a that's probably one of the worst rolls he can get. So that was a full on miss. And Rook's turn is done. I'm going to go ahead before Rook ends his turn. Although technically I should have done this before I rolled for... Um, Gav is I'm going to go ahead and use Hyper Energy HP Potion, and it says an ally within SOI heals three and gains one uh, stamina point. So I'm actually going to heal away all of Remy's damage, and then I'm going to give her an additional stamina point, which is pretty sweet. So she's going to go into this with a total of five, which is pretty awesome. So she's going to have a lot of stamina, giving her a better chance at surviving this, or at least putting the final nail in the coffin. So Remy, what are you gonna do here? Well, you've got a, you can go ahead and you can, ex we're gonna exhaust your war ax. So this thing right here, as we did before, so we can gain the book benefit. We get two white dice, and we know that this guy can dodge at the beginning of each turn. So we're gonna roll for a dodge first. Uh, oh, that's pretty high. Okay, so he's up to a total of 14 right now. Uh, do I want to, and at this point, uh, you're supposed to choose to empower before you roll your dodge roll. And I, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to wait to the second one is what I want to empower. So I'm doing an attack and it's at a total of 14 defense going in, which is aggressive. So I'm rolling these two white dice, just crossing my fingers that this is going to pan out, but I highly doubt it. Yeah, that was probably the worst roll I could have ever gotten. Um, I could exhaust a hammer helm to re-roll this, but I'm not going to do it on this particular roll because it's just so bad. Um, so I'm going to let that, you know, attack just go right past as a complete miss. And because I actually attacked, um, it's going to counter me. So it's going to counter me back. Um, and it's going to attack at a reach of two. So this is going to have... This is going to come right back at Remy, unfortunately, this time, because Remy's actually is countering the individual who actually made the attack. So that's unfortunate. Um, so we're going to go ahead and grab two of these dice, roll these, and see if Remy can handle this. Now, first, before I do this, yeah, let's try to dodge it. I'm going to use my cult shirt. I'm going to exhaust that to dodge, giving me a black die. 
Come on, give me some good dice. Okay, so that's, oh no, it's, so he got exactly what he needed. Um, so he got 12 and I got 12 because the two right there. So he gets one, two, three, four hits. Well, at least I softened the blow a little bit, but uh, still got hit there. That was pretty nasty. Okay, and she still has three stamina left, so she's gonna spend two to attack. So she's gonna get her two white dice. Um, this individual does not get to dodge this time because it's the second time I'm attacking in the same turn. I'm gonna use one stamina point to gain a black die in. And we are gonna cross our fingers that I can roll high because he only has 11 defense, no extra buffs. Please let this land. And we got it, I think. I think we got it because we get the plus one. Uh, so we have six, that's 10, plus the one for flanking is 11. So we, we definitely hit his defense level. Now it's just a matter of can we actually convert anything. Now I already exhausted the war axe, so I don't get to make use of books. Um, but I do get to make use of shields and stars at all times. So shields are one, two, three, four, four damage. So the Gevedan is dead. We had knocked him over. We overkilled him, which was awesome. It all worked out in the end. And this is the point in time where you would head back to the actual game book and you would take a look at some of the secretive information with this red decoder in order to determine, you know, what special things you gain from the end of the encounter. I'm gonna keep all that secretive. This is actually gonna conclude the Madeira Unintentional Malum Act One Kickstarter preview. So I'm not gonna go any further into the game than this. I just wanted to show you how it plays so I can help you make an informed decision on the Kickstarter that is currently running. I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys so much for watching and as always keep on rolling solo.